meeting today is May 2nd. I'm going to start the meeting, the Islam Inland Wetlands Agency regular meeting of Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, I'm going to have Diane and Nancy be seated today since we need two alternates. While you guys are standing, we'll start with the pledge. agenda is public delegations. Public delegations is the time when members of the public are invited to speak to the Commission about certain matters, issues or concerns related to approved wetland permits and in-house proposals or general topics of discussion are open to comment. Sorry, I didn't introduce everybody first. I'm off today. All right, so we have Phyllis Berger, Leonard Salter, Diane Gardner, I'm Kristen Chantrell, Don Finister, Nancy Kalal, Greg McIntyre, Gary Gage is our wetlands officer, Sue Spang is our reporting secretary. All right, continuing public delegations, agenda items, referrals, applications subject to a decision by the commission, a public hearing or litigation may not be discussed. The members of the commission will not directly answer questions or make comment during delegations. Anyone here today? If you could just come up and state your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Donald Danella, D-A-N-I-L-A. I live at 24 Pat Against at Dry Ivy Slime. For background purposes, please note that I'm a member, I'm a Board of Selectmen appointed member to the Niantic River Watershed Committee and the East Lime Commission for the Conservation of Natural Resources. I'm also a member of the conservation organization Save the River, Save the Hills, serving on the hashtag Smart Solar Team and helping to assess potential environmental impacts related to local developments in East Lime and Waterford. Please note, however, that tonight I'm speaking solely for myself. I, among many others, have become increasingly concerned over the failures of several recent large developmental projects in East Slime to properly control erosion and silt-laden stormwater discharges during heavy rainstorms. The first example includes the then logged over and cleared Antares solar field off Walnut Hill Road. A significant rainstorm in March 2016 resulted in extremely heavy sedimentation to a tributary of Cranberry Meadow Brook draining this field. The adjacent riparian areas and downstream into the mainstream main stem brook. Some may recall that this was a matter before this agency for some months thereafter. Why is this a concern to me and others? I would like to point out that Cranberry Meadow Brook and its tributaries are home to brook trout, so any sediments deposited onto stream gravel areas that would affect brook trout reproduction as they need clean gravels for spawning. East Lyme and some of our neighboring towns to the east are the last remaining coastal towns in Connecticut still containing native brook trout streams, which is significant as this species requires cool, pollution-free water and is an indicator species for cold water streams. Secondly, la early last year I was personally informed by the Connecticut Deep ex officio member of the Niantic River Watershed Committee of a large discharge of sediments emanating from the north of Brook Road housing development known as Brookside Apartments into a tributary of Bride Brook and thence into the main stem brook itself. Town staff were promptly notified and the Conservation Commission sent a written memo to this agency regarding this issue. East Lyme is fortunate to host one of the largest runs of anatomous alewife in southern New England with each spring an estimated 68 to 354,000 fish ascending Bride Brook from Long Island Sound spawn in Bride Lake. Any degradation of Bride Brook water quality affecting alewife migratory behavior during this species spawning run would be disastrous. Finally, the most recent incident occurred within the Upland Review area under the purview of this agency. This past April 23rd, a Save the River, Save the Hills board member took a video of a large sediment plume running from the Noble gas station site into the Banning Cove portion of the Upper Niantic River, just north of the Boston Post Road, where Latimer Brook enters the cove. I don't think I need to point out to you the ecological and human values offered by the Niantic River, including, again, an anatomist alewife spawning run in Latimer Brook. 
The Vice President of Save the River, Save the Hill shared this information with both town staff <coughs> and personnel for Noble Gas and their construction contractors. Remedies were subsequently taken, including adding hay bales, sill fences, and stone barriers. Subsequently, I visited the site last Sunday, April 30th, after some heavy rain had fallen and took some photos while there. Regrettably, these remedies were only partially successful. Most of the sheet flow coming off the main entrance to the site ran unimpeded downhill to concentrate along the new road edge curbing. The turbidity of this runoff was quite apparent. This was added to by additional flow coming down from the cemetery access road that these additional measures failed to remediate. I was able to contrast the silt-laden turbid flow on the north or development side of the post road with the absolutely clear water containing no sediments that was running downhill along the curbing on the south side of the highway. Further down on the post road from the site, I saw piles of sand on the road's shoulder likely deposited from this storm runoff. Sand can also be observed in the rock riprap and vegetation on the side of the road leading down to the river, likely from this and previous runoff events. I believe that most finer silts remain in suspension, however, and were then washed into the river. Frankly, I've seen a common theme among developers confronted about these instances, with them whining that these particular rainstorms are greater than predicted or anticipated, thereby resulting in unexpected on-site erosion and off-site discharge of sediments. Not properly preparing for heavy rainstorms cannot be used as an excuse for the failure to control sediments flowing off construction sites. It is now readily apparent to most scientists and other rational people that global warming has resulted in more frequent, intense rainstorms. Construction engineers and managers need to acknowledge this fact and plan for it with better designs and more robust practices and mitigation members, uh, measures. Planning for potential rainstorms of four inches or more needs to be done during the construct, construction design phase. Similarly, I would urge state and local regulatory oversight agencies, including this one, to review their standards and requirements and determine if they are adequate. Perhaps the pending revised publication of the Connecticut Erosion and Sediment Control Guidelines and the Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual will provide some solutions, although I'll leave this up to the professionals using these references. I must say that town staff has, have reacted promptly to each of these reported instances, but I think a proactive rather than a reactive stance is still needed. All issues associated with stormwater discharges to our local water courses need to be addressed. It appears that many large construction sites are not adequately designed from, ero from an erosion or stormwater management perspective in the first place. There may be less than thorough reviews of development plans by state or local engineers with an over-reliance on simply trusting the applicant. As such, we need a more rigorous oversight more inspections and accountability from the developer, as well as mitigation for any damages these discharges cause. Separate and distinct remedies may be needed for each phase of construction. I also know that the town's inland wetland agency and watercourses regulations are presently under review and revision. Due to their length and my recent decision to address you this evening, I could not perform a review and say that any or all of my suggestions and concerns have yet been addressed. I hope they have. So in conclusion, I believe that improved standards and practices and proactive oversight will prevent further occurrences of the type that I've mentioned. This should eliminate or greatly reduce the possibility of environmental degradation to our town's waterways. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Sorry, can I just ask you a question real quick? Um, you mentioned the, the Connecticut erosion and sedimentation plans. Have those been updated? Are you aware? Um, all I know is that uh, the Connecticut Deep um, ex officio member of the Niantica Watershed Commission told me that they're presently under revision. I do not know if they've been um, to finally finalized and, and let out for uh, use by others. Okay. We have not received updated versions okay. as of yet. Because yeah. I do agree that we need more sedimentation controls during construction. Um, we are currently revising our regulations. We are very much at the start of that process. Um, so any, you know, public feedback as we move through the regulation changes, I think would be helpful. Can we make increases to what was the minimums for the government standards? Like if we can like increase our vegetative buffer in this town, something like that. 
Like, is that, you, you, is, I mean, it's out of like, maybe maybe say it's 10 feet elsewhere, but we can say, hey, it's 20 feet where we live. So that way we can like. You could. Okay. Yeah, we, we went from 100 to 300. So. I, I understand. Yeah. But um, um, what I would recommend, uh, just being that Mr. Danilla is on our uh, Natural Resources Commission, um, maybe referring the document over to them for review. I think that's um, a great idea. And we can get their input. Sure. Yeah, and, the, and there's a copy online currently. Right? There should be. And then, and then, um, if there isn't, we'll make sure it is, but then we'll get the, the draft copy over to them. Yeah. They can start reviewing. That would be great. This is going to be a lengthy process for us, so if you could provide some feedback. We'd be happy to. We yeah. have, of course, a meeting um, next week, I believe, the 10th, so I will bring that up. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking we're probably going to go through, like, I don't know, 10, 15 pages of meeting or something by the time we get there's so many. So There's many things lot. to discuss. So I want to make sure that we all thoroughly take a look at them. So, if, you know, no rush, but if you could take a look, that would be fantastic. Certainly. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Could we also have a copy of his uh, of your notes? Would you mind? Certainly. Oh, okay. I hate getting up how many times, so I can write a script. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't forget to say anything, so that's always good. Exactly. Yeah. All right, next on the agenda is public hearings. We have none. Um, the acceptance of the minutes from March 7th, 2023 at regular meeting. Do I hear a motion to accept the minutes? Make a motion to accept the minutes of March 7th, 2023. Thank you, do I hear a second? I'll second the motion, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, next is ex officio report, Anne. I'm um, sorry, I didn't announce you earlier. That's okay. Ann Chicago, oh, sorry. Board of Finance, uh, ex officio. Um, so, um, I guess from the top, annual town meeting is going to be May 8th um, at East Lime High School at 7 p.m. to uh, review the budget. And then the referendum is May 18th. That's at the community center. And that goes from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. where people can vote. Um, Let's see. As it stands now, th the latest numbers I have is uh, the budget was up 5.8 million or 7.2 percent, um, and um, we'll wait and see what happens at the referendum. Um, Dominion property. Um, the first selectman is supposed to be meeting with Dominion, um, probably in the near future, to try to negotiate doing some uh, level one uh, brownfield testing. Um, to see what contaminants, are, I guess, are there. Um, zoning. Is that just on the property in general, or is there a specific location they're looking? They're just on the property. So let me just get my notes real quick. So what they're saying is um, the contaminants we were talking about the other night. Um, I guess in the 70s there were some transformers there that would leak PCBs, mm -hmm. and PCBs don't spread. Um, but they, you know, expensive to remediate is, is what it is. Okay. So we're trying to negotiate with Dominion. Uh, I don't think they're overly happy to, to meet with, with us about that. Um, zoning board, I was actually um, at ex officio at the past few meetings, and um, they approved a special permit for the property located um, you'll know it is, is the, um, near Baptist Lane. It's 338, 344, and 348 Main Street to have a mixed-use project. So I think it's going to be um, about 21 units and then stores on the bottom. Um, and there was three public hearings on the matter. Um, a lot of the public were not overly excited about it. Um, and... Um, uh, there was many people who spoke against it based on um, parking issues and uh, congestion um, and a lot of foot traffic that would be going along there. So in, in response to that, the developer uh, had decided to widen Baptist Lane, I think another, um, um, I think it's t to 23 feet, and um, tried to make some other changes. So it was approved, though, by the zoning board on uh, April 20th. So that's going to be going forward. Um, board of Selectmen also, we had a discussion. 
to change the time that the uh, town hall is open. So uh, right now it's open 8 to 4, Monday through uh, Friday. And what they're proposing is it would go 8 to 5, Monday through Thursday, and then 8 to 11.30 on Friday. Because I guess a lot of people come in around 4 o'clock mm -hmm. trying to, you know, get out of work and want to file or taxes, pay a bill, or talk to somebody, and everything's kind of shutting down. Mm -hmm. So they're going to try that for a trial for a few months and, and see how it goes. Um, that's about all I have at this point. Anybody have any questions? Is the gas station part of uh, the three-story building? I mean, are they taking the gas station out? Because there's, uh, there's a Victorian house. And then um, I think two other houses. I yeah, haven't heard anything. The gas station downtown is there's some construction going on there, but it's not. Part that's of that. not. Um, yeah, it's I've not never heard of any gas station, station with that. Yeah. They're taking out. Um, what's the name of the restaurant? Um, Cafe yeah, Cafe Soul, Soul, the Victorian house, and then some other house that's there to build. It's a building this. that has the Buckley uh, mm -hmm. appraisal. Yeah, yes. the in it. yeah, and um, yeah. Cafe Soul is, is right. moving to a different location. Um, what about the um, Hathaway property? Has there been any decision made with that? No, yeah. we've been, um, I think at this point, the town is trying to um, order an appraisal of the property um, to see what, what the value is. Um, because it was, um, there was a lot of kind of, back and forth as to what actually was at issue, what part of the land, because certain pieces were sold off and everything. So I think they've kind of um, getting now a, an appraisal of the, of the property. I think with the town seems to be growing so much, the value of open space for future generations is, is a lot. And even if they have to go out and get like a general obligation bond to bond it, I, I think it would be worth it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, they're all discussing it. I mean, property, they're not making any more of it, and it's, you know, it's going to have a value down the road a lot more than, you know, what the town would be. Yeah. Also, too, um, I was happened to be talking to a realtor, and they said, like, right now, um, usually there's about 120 houses on the market in there's the spring. None. There's, like, right. I think yeah. 15 to yeah. 17 houses for sale. So, yeah, so um, I, I don't know if it's just because of the pandemic that a lot of people, you know, have decided to, to come here um, and get out of the cities and we stuff. We were in the New York Times. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the house, one of them was right next to where I live, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right. Our, you didn't see the article? Oh, I'll, I'll send it to you, yeah. Any, any other questions? Oh. Um, the, you mentioned Dominion is going to come and talk to Mr. Sheary. Um, yeah, they're going to kind of try to negotiate and see what to try to get some um, investigation done. Understood. That, that's um, the on, a, on a kind of a related subject, uh, hearing headlines that state state government is starting to think about uh, spent fuel removal and ex nuclear site remediation. Um, it, do you know if there's any? Potential discussion about spent fuel removal from the Dominion property. About what removal? Spent fuel. I haven't heard anything about that. We, I don't know if you recall. Several years ago, we did have a meeting where Dominion uh, provided a public information session here, indicating that their storage ca capacity would be maxed in 2050 um, mm -hmm. with the dry cast on site. So that was the last we heard, mm. and I think we all were waiting for was it Yucca Mountain. But not, it's not going to happen. So I'm not sure what the plan is going forward, but that's a good, good question. Yeah. When was the meeting? How long ago? Several years ago. Several years ago. Okay. Oh, I'm going to guess five to six, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't remember it myself. All set? I think it was, yeah, I think it was in 2020 we had that meeting. Oh, 2020. Yeah, okay. So. years left. Okay. Mm. Good. Yes, thank okay. you. Sure. All right, so there's no new business, no pending applications. So moving on to old business, the Inland Wetland and Watercourse Regulations 
proposed draft revisions. Um, recognizing that everyone just got these a few days ago and there are a lot of changes here, um, I'm thinking what we do is just kind of go through page by page and spend a little time each meeting going through them to see if anyone has any inputs or changes um, for discussion. If everyone's good with that. Not there. Not there. But we'll get them up on the website. Oh, okay. My apologies. Okay. Um, so the first part, section one, title and authority, I don't think really, it's just kind of some legal words that is required to be there. I don't think there's anything there. I think starting with definitions, you can go through. Does anyone have a copy of these? <laughs> I freaking left it there. Oh, it's fine. Now that we understand the intent to review small subsets um, in these uh, in these meetings, and um, we're going to get through making sure all of us have copies and some posted and all that stuff. Um, recommend if we do do re revisions that we kind of repeat next week after everyone's had a chance to stew on it, prepare, mm -hmm. and set uh, page count targets. <coughs> um. Gary, would we be able to provide anyone with copies if they would come to Town Hall and pick them up here yeah. on the commission? Is anyone interested in getting a copy from Town Hall? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Sure. One, two, three, three, four. So, Diane, you have So, if you could print out, I would say maybe five because Doreen and Sam. So, let's just. I can just make them sufficient. Okay. 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 So, if, if everyone could kind of swing by at their convenience and pick up a copy. Um, to go through and I would say to start how about we how about we go through um, let's see sections one two and three that will be everyone's homework for next meeting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess, but while well, we're all here for some discussion, I have a few things. Um, so, we discussed potentially for regulated activities assigning some impervious area calculations to the uh, minor, intermediate, and significant regulated activity. Um, not really sure what would warrant where where do you even search for where that would be? Like what what kind of numbers do we come up with that? I mean I know that we have the hundred cubic yards. Is that indicative of a certain square footage? No. Or is I mean, that just that's that's just a hundred cubic cubic yards of material. Right. It's kind of a volume. It's it's like once you get beyond that it, it gets you're into a larger it's pretty significant more significant, mm -hmm. significant activity. Um, in terms of impervious surfaces we do know that when you increase the impervious surface of a water of a watershed to 10%, we start to see a degradation in water quality. So, you know, maybe on a, somewhere on a scale of one to 10, you can have you know zero to five percent; those are minor. Five to eight percent are intermediate, and eight to ten, or, or however you want to. Break oh, that so up. if you look at each, if you, we look at each property individually and say if it's over 10% of the the square footage of the property. Right. If there they're creating impervious surface on that property more than ten percent, then that would be like a significant. Right. So I would I would note that if you look at the zoning code, they have uh, regulations for lot coverage. Typically, they're anywhere from twenty to twenty five percent. There and most people don't ever come that close. There, there's a couple lots in town that are. Mm -hmm. uh, short of being a commercial lot and it's paved or something like that. But in terms of residential structures, there's not very many. Um, so I, I think maybe that might be a good sliding scale on the previous coverage to address that. Yeah, that, I like that idea, because percentage-wise, because I was trying to think of square footage, but then like per individual properties, you could have a, a quarter acre lot and then the ginormous house on it is more of an impact than if you have 10 acres and you're putting a giant house on it. So if we do the percentage, okay. Um, and then also I was looking at the vernal pool definition. 
because I love vernal pools. And we do ask on our wetlands regulation, our wetlands um, applications, if there's any vernal pools present on the property. Mm. So I suggest we use the definition from the old line inland wetlands and watercourses regulation. I'll just read it real quick. Well, I'll read ours. Vernal pool means a seasonal or permanent watercourse in a defined depression or basin that lacks a fish, fish population and supports or is capable of supporting breeding and development of amphibian and invertebrate species recognized as obligate to such watercourses. So, um, Old Lyme, their definition is vernal pool, a seasonal or permanent body of standing water with the following characteristics. Occurs within a confined natural or man-made depression or basin. B, contains water for at least two consecutive months during the growing season. C, typically lacks a fish population. And D, supports or has the capability of supporting populations of vernal pool obligate species. The existence of a vernal pool shall be determined in the accordance with the criteria for identification set forth in the draft Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection Bureau of Water Management document entitled Guidance to Connecticut's Municipal Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Agency's Vernal Pool Definitions Indicators, the Appendix E. Note all potential vernal pools that cannot be properly evaluated for confirmation as vernal pools for reasons associated with season, et cetera, are to be considered to be vernal pools for regulatory purposes until such time as proper determination can be made. And I like that last especially because my concern is that, I mean, I recognize that we don't have any further requirements on vernal pools. However, I think that some people go to, in the dry season, to identify if there's a vernal pool there or not, and, and you can't determine that. So if we can say, hey, you don't know, so we're going to say it's a vernal pool until you can prove otherwise when it's actually the proper season, I think would be a big addition to our requirements. But that's just my idea. Isn't that like a certain soil type as well for a vernal pool? Yeah, the, the would be very specific. Yeah. No. Um, it's, no. Not, it's not a different type of soil, it's yeah. just... No, I well, know what a vernal pool is. No, no, I know. Soil, yeah. So. yeah. I would say it's not necessarily poorly drained soil. Oh, of course. So, because in the summertime, you can yes. delineate as a wetland. Mm -hmm. So, from there, yeah, the soil characteristics are different than a wetland, but we regulate it the same. I would say, and I have no problem, I can add in that definition. Um, I, I would then ask, being that we don't have any regulations for vernal pools, do we want to adopt it? Or is that something that we can look at when other towns have adopted for regulating vernal pools? I think Greenwich is very proactive. Right. It kind of comes pools um, so we can look at what they're doing down there yeah I know so old Lyme I mean I I prefer our 300 foot upland review area old Lyme does a hundred foot wetland or, or water course upland review area but vernal pools specifically they, they go to 400 feet that's where we go to 300 foot. yeah so we do have that 300 foot coverage but I think having um, extra requirements surrounding vernal pools I think is important so I don't know uh, where we integrate that, but it's something for everybody to kind of consider and take a look at. We definitely have to protect them. Yeah, so. yeah, I agree. But uh, by the same token, we can have as many definitions as we want, but if some Joe Schmo comes in and said, I'm a licensed surveyor and I, can, I don't see any vernal pools, then it's even as has happened often, well, the, the problem is is we don't right now have a seasonal requirement as far as when they need to identify vernal pools. Individual. So I think we need to identify that seasonal requirement. And then, I mean, technically, if, if they're saying there's none and there are, they could lose their license. Well, but look at the land trust on Walnut Grassy Hill. That illegal split of four parcels is three housing nuts now and 48 houses to be. And Lindsay Rush proved that there's vernal pools there. You agreed that there were wetlands there, and yet it's a housing lot. Got sold as a housing lot. What could our regular look at the noble, uh, the noble uh, soapy noble? That's within the 300 foot review, and we let that go. How did that happen? Well, it was a, it was always a it was always a commercial. car wash. Yeah. Well, but now the mini bar mini. The Cisco oh, so mini thing, we let that go. Oh, the, the gas, yeah, the, the gas, gas station. Yeah. Never we went didn't have anything. We didn't have anything. Uh, we didn't have anything to say about that gas station place. Well, and that's a shame. Yeah, well, okay. because it's all it's all water that the town of Nyingen drinks. Oh yeah. Yeah, no. Okay. So we need to figure out how to protect 
how how to protect what we have and be foolproof. So it's rough. We're at the bottom of a watershed. <laughs> we are the last stop from the whole country of north of us. So this is it's really hard to humiliate, humiliate any of that. But we stuff. can do it. I'm sure there's we, a, right. there's a well, way to so do it. So I think that's why we're, we're discussing the regulations stuff. because they're they, they've been pretty loosely defined, increase. and now's our opportunity to define them clearly. And with adding numbers as far as determining what would be significant, determining you know when they what needs to be part of the application, like this is our opportunity to, to strengthen our regulations to give us a little bit better, uh, I guess. More teeth. Yeah, yeah. Frankly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, do we need teeth? Great yeah, we do. And I and I think there's been a lot of really good changes and updates here, uh, which is why I want us all to make sure we spend our time going through and reviewing them. Mm. Um, and making sure that we're considering everything because I think this is a good opportunity to be able to get a little bit better control over all the development that's happening and making sure it's done appropriately with, you know, concerns of the environment. So, but I think we also need follow-up. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the problem that there's no follow-up. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's really one of you, either. and there's all these developments <laughs> going on. And how do we? I mean. So, I, I mean, with the rain events in the last three yeah. days, right, since Friday, I've just been running around like a chicken um, and, and, and on top of having to prepare for the meeting. And thankfully, there's not a, a ton on our agenda tonight. At the same time, we did receive uh, an application for a, a subdivision. Um, so that would be technically the data receipt would be today. Uh, we got it yesterday, so it's not on our agenda. Um, and that's for a five-lot subdivision on the corner of Upper Walnut Hill and Holmes Road. Um, so that will be next meeting's agenda? Agenda item, yes. But okay. yeah, with that said, like, it, there's just, there's a ton of work to be done, a lot of follow-up. Uh, again, we had issues with Noble Gas. Um, thankfully, nothing with Sophie Noble. Um, Monaco Ford stayed intact, um, but we did have problems with the North Brightbrook Apartments. Now, while uh, all I think most of you know that we still have an application that's under appeal, um, and the 80 units that he had approved via zoning were outside the 100-foot upland review. That being said, we've had runoff make it its way across the street through the drainage system. We talked about that. We talked about that. Okay. Talked about. So that yeah, being said, that. DEP yeah. has contacted me twice in, since the project started. Um, once for the, the, the tributary in the rear of the property, that issue has been resolved uh, because I don't know exactly what happened there or, or, or how any turbidity from the site actually made it downstream in that case. So I was still scratching my head on that. Oh, that was pretty early on, right? That was very early yeah, on. Yeah, I remember that. Um, but subsequent to that, uh, there's with the drainage in the street across toward Bride Lake, um, thankfully there's a large shoulder, if you will, to before the lake to, to absorb <coughs> impact. Um, but we identified what the problems are with the developer and asked them to repair them. So we got to do clean out the silt sacks, improve the tracking pads. Uh, the remaining silt fence seems to be in good working order. Um, but the big issue was really the construction entrances. And that's where the majority of the material would flush right out onto the street and then into the stormwater system, which while there are silt sacks in those catch basins. Um, there's a couple that are kind of overwhelmed <laughs> uh, in, in or not maybe installed properly. So I've got to get Mr. Pizzaglia to rearrange. I think there's one where there's a, there's a green pipe that comes out of the hill. This is down uh, south of his site um, on the west side of the road. Uh, the, the pipe's been there for as long as I can remember, and it drains directly into the catch basin. Oh, is it white? It, it's like it's white, and, then it's, yeah. and I think, the, yeah, there's a white, you'll see a white elbow with a green pipe, or I think it's, maybe it's all white. Anyhow, uh, that silt sack isn't completely covering the entire catch basin inlet, so <coughs> that's where I think water, turbid water, made its way into the catch basin and across the street. So, uh, and anyhow, DEP Fisheries informed us, I've, been in touch with them. Um, I've notified the developer, and they've begun to take action in correcting that. I went by there today, and it looks like the stone he <laughs> put in for his uh, tracking pad is just silted up again as a result of the last the rain over the weekend. So it's just a constant 
maintenance, but it's it is uphill. what it is. And it's all yes. uphill. Greg, but, but why wasn't this caught before when we were looking at it as an application that there would be issues like this? Um, I don't think you can necessarily predict that there would be issues. I think you, yeah. you, you take the assumption that there are going to be issues, or if there are, what are you going to do to mitigate them? And the plans are designed around that. So based on the plans, there should be no issues, right? The plans themselves, the engineers do provide the proper the plans. It's getting the developer to actually follow the plan. Yeah, this controls fail too. So when the controls fail, that's where we have to perform enforcement action. And when you look at the, the to issue cease and desist orders, one takes time to write them up, two, 10 days, you have to give them a show cause hearing. So through the process, I mean, obviously if you have repeated failures, then I think that's where, you know, here we're at two failures. So State like, reported failures. I'll be it. Yeah. And there's, um, there's no so driveways or anything else <coughs> you know, put in yet, so it's just going to get worse. Until they pave. So I talked to Jason about paving. Uh, he indicated that because he has the two buildings up, he plans to pave hopefully in the next two weeks. I said, well, we can still get another eight inches of rain in the next two weeks. <laughs> yeah. So um, the sooner you pave and get some of the stormwater system online, the, the better off we are. But it's a matter of getting them to pave. I can go after him, and I can issue cease and desist orders, and we can we can do that. I think what we would be doing is extending our jurisdiction in the other direction, not or maybe from both directions. It really wouldn't matter at that point. But the the stream and the tributary in the back of the property, I'm not really concerned about it because that is uphill. It's everything to the south, and mm -hmm. I think that was the commission's concern to begin mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think when when you look at our current regs as they are written, you can extend your authority if you can make the determination that they're is a likelihood of an impact, and as we've seen, there, there is a potential. So I'm not, I, I can't verify for certain if the turbid water made its way to Brad Lake. I don't believe so. I think I would have heard more from DEP if, if that was the case, uh, particularly because of the, the LY front there. Um, and as I said, thankfully we have a large shoulder to, to buffer that lake, at least that, that there was one. Um, in the meantime, I. I I think it's just a matter of staying on top of the developer and following up routinely. Uh, I will work with the zoning official to put more pressure on the developer to, to keep the site secure. That's the yeah, that would be good because there's... So, if I may, I, I think we've lost track of where we were. We're talking about the regulations and the suggestion was that we adopt the old line definition of a vernal pool. Mm -hmm. If I heard you correctly, I heard them say that uh, we really can't tell if it's a vernal pool until we go through the spring season to see if it floods. Do, do we have a survey of our vernal pools? Do we have an idea? I actually, um, I would have to check with the state. Maybe they have some sort of inventory, but I don't believe we have a local one. Uh, just it would be hard, but I, I, the downside, I think, to the developers is if you come in with a project in June and we say to them, well, we can't approve this until next yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So the, the regulation states that if you can't prove that it's not, you're going to assume that it is. So they don't have to prove. They can say, you know what, we don't know. We're going to apply for this in July. We don't know if there's a vernal pool here or not. Could be, so we're going to say there is. And then we can, you know, we don't actually have any further um, restrictions around vernal pools currently, which is something that we need to discuss. But then it would um, warrant a little bit further uh, protection if if it's a vernal pool, or so, if so, it's potentially a vernal pool. So we're putting the developer in a position of, of if there's any questions, saying, okay, this is a vernal pool because I want to move the project forward. Basically, it's a conservative approach if you're adamant on moving forward with your project. Mm -hmm. And I mean, from your perspective, a lot of the applications we see come in around now. So the, the, this is when they're... So short of like a site development <coughs> in the water and sewer shed, where you have the, that infrastructure, a lot of these sites require them to do monitoring, right? Site monitoring for test pits. So that usually is done in kind of like six months to a year before. Mm -hmm. If our regulations are such that it kind of calls this out, they're doing their due diligence and their homework, they can maybe start monitoring for infernal pools earlier on. Yeah, that's true. Um, 
Because we asked them <coughs> flat out on the application, are there vernal pools located on the property? And almost everybody says no. Yeah. Whereas they, them. yeah, where they could say, I'm unsure, so I, uh, I could say yes, just so that, you know, that we're aware. I mean, you can tell by the chain, by the depression where there's potentially water, if there could potentially be a vernal pool, or it's just a river and there's none. So I think it. We had it checked out a few times. <coughs> The town did right. We paid a couple times. I checked out the dirt that it was safe because it was a question about there's a vernal pond at the Bride Brook or not. Wasn't that what happened at one point? Uh, there was, was a like potential, uh, there was a discussion that there was a potential pond, not vernal pool, yeah, that was okay. filled in. But oh, right. There was never any. It was an actual it pond, yes. Yeah, not a okay. Was it actually able to determine if there was a pond? Oh, yeah. There was okay. no conclusive evidence that there, that there was or wasn't. Well, we found gold, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. Vernal gold. <laughs> Vernal gold, yeah. Uh, joking aside, the, the whole vulner, vul, vernal pool issue and uh, definition leading to protective measures by what enforcement mechanism leads me to uh, come up with a, a recommendation for the commission to consider. Um, we talk about how enforcement is uh, problematic. Uh, there's only so many of us and we're not paid and there's one of Gary and he's not paid enough. Um, there's, uh, that, that's not a budgetary proposal. The, um, if we in our regulations require that each application have a, an erosion control measure uh, compliance designee or representative within uh, the developer that is executing the project with a list of things to check and log um, like the silt, the thingers around the catch basins. Uh, you shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't have to tell someone to go fix the catch basins. Wouldn't it be more practical to have someone on the project walk touch points throughout the project and make small adjustments as they as they happen? So in response, to, yes, I, I would agree with that. And, and that a good example would be the Gateway Project where they had someone who's designated to do that through the whole project. So I found that extremely helpful. Um, they would, on a weekly basis, submit stormwater reports mm. to me, and so I would know kind of the condition of the site on a weekly basis um, uh, without necessarily having to go out there as frequently as I had anticipated. So with that, we could like require as part of, you know, condition of approvals or, or a standard condition. A compliance plan. That this information be submitted uh, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, depending on maybe the scope of the project, but mm -hmm. um, some, you know, we can certainly come up with some draft language that would. Yeah, but the person doing that work is employed by the applicant. Yeah, I mean, what's issue. the possible, sure. what's the, you know, yeah, what's the chance ah. that he's going to go, oh, everything is sure. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> everything is I mean, is let's, awesome, let's be honest, right? maybe in the perfect world, yeah. but. You, you bring up a great yeah. point. <laughs> so, if you have a list of logs that are required, I've, t I've checked it here, I've checked it here, I've checked it here. Oh, we have an event and there's silt everywhere. Let me see the logs. Are these, are these logs accurate? How could that be? Um, and then there's a, a record that kind of goes, goes back that you can, and data to piece through, like, are you really complying or not? Um, if you have a positive indication that there is a problem and it indicates the logs aren't being met, that's a deeper problem. And if what we caught or what is apparent is uh, is right in front of us, what else is out there? And then what would be the so, so what are you going to do about yeah, it if you find somebody is being dishonest with filling out the logs? I mean, then, as, then as we can go board, cease and desist. Of, yeah, they'd be in uh, violation method. of their permit. How right. many times have we done that? Or how many times have we sat here and said, oh, we're going to do this with this person and not follow through on it? Well, we're working on the plan right now. Here. That's well, that, I, and that's what I wonder, too, if, if legally you could find out. If, if someone has a cease and desist against them, can that prevent them from uh, filing any new applications? Can we put that mm, into our no, regulation or legally? So. No. It's like a, it's like a business I know. I'm wondering if that's... You, you would not probably issue them a permit for any new activities on the lot until they resolve their thing, current cease and desist or mm -hmm. whatever the issue was from that perspective. <laughs> that wouldn't prevent them from filing a zoning permit or a building permit or even a subdivision application. 
Uh, unless, unless you had, I think, that passed by ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as, as it pertains to the wetlands, you just wouldn't necessarily consider any new in the wetland activities, reg any new regulated activities on a site until the violation is corrected. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, we've seen people just kind of walk all over the cease and desist and yeah. ignore that. And and now, what I have seen is where you, sorry to interrupt, uh, but where you have a cease and desist order and they're going to conduct these regulated activities to correct it, but that's all done under the order. So you have, as, as the order stands, it gets filed on the land record. So theoretically, if they try to sell the property or if they borrow against it or whatever, they're going to make that a little more difficult for, for anyone. They're going to probably have to correct the violation, have us release the cease and desist order and file that piece of paperwork on the land record. So that, that at the end of the day, is what gets their attention. Um, well, fine, also. And, 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 and also I, have that. Yeah. And I don't think we've used that. I can't remember any yeah. situation where we've used it. We, we used that once on uh, Mr. Barbero, I think it was the property in Crescent, oh, was it Atlantic Beach. Ave, Crescent Beach. Yeah, but that's in what, 10 years? Yeah. 10 years. Once in 10 years. And, and you've had forward. people come in here, and there's been big violations, and we've kind of said, oh, you know, if you move that shed, it's going to make more of a mess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I just don't think. Or just fix it. Yeah, I know. Be that as it may. I don't think we're a strong group as far as, you know, oh, oh, for oh. the environment. What, what are you going to say something <laughs> else? Oh, the. <clears throat> I feel strong for the environment, but the well, um, I think no. the desired the desired end state that we're after is that the folks interacting with the environment know how to comply and choose to comply. That is what that is the system we want to promote and the behavior we want to promote. Having uh, a self compliance program, um, attribute list to review, uh, uh, touch points to check, what logs to fill out, whatever whatever it takes to promote that behavior. Um, not relying upon cease and desist orders and your big hammer uh, of enforcement, I, I think is desirable. Nobody and you think it works. wants a fine. We don't want to give it. They don't want to pay it. Nobody wants a cease and desist order. It gets ugly. So how do you, how do you achieve that desired end state of self-compliance uh, with the tools at hand? And if they, they're not at hand, how do you make a new one? That's what I'm proposing. Yeah, I think with that in mind, maybe that's where we we just strengthen up our regulations and yeah <coughs> in terms of those on-site monitors there, there is a certification uh you can become a certified professional in erosion it's my erosion sedimentation control <laughs> um, so those those individuals do sure. exist I'll do it, sure. they hold a credential and like anyone who holds a credential right you you, you follow a certain rule of ethics so if you violate that, you run the risk of losing your license or your credential. So that being said, I would think you could potentially, as a, you know, if you're conditioning, that they have one of these monitors that they be certified as, as mm -hmm. a professional erosion control specialist. Um, so, you know, it's not maybe a professional engineer certification, mm -hmm. but certainly at least they're qualified and they, right. they, they've studied the ENS guidelines, you know. So I'm, I'm actually... Greg, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm wondering if I can task you with potentially looking if there's any uh, updates to the sedimentation control plan at the state level. Um, see if we can start integrating that within our own plans. Sure. Thank you. Because as Don mentioned, he, he heard that they're revising them. I imagine they probably are. It's been a long time. And if we could adopt those, that would be a, a good start mm -hmm. at least. There's a lot of, lot of independent groups putting forth better ideas about how to do this. So yeah, I mean, in all the plans, that we're getting these better. huge rainfall events, and they're very common, and the yeah, we, controls we, that are in place aren't capable of, of keeping sedimentation out of the water anymore. So there's got to be changes somewhere yeah. that hopefully yeah. we can adopt. Veg because they already say vegetated buffers increase the size of those. Yeah, less clearing, um, probably. Yeah, you can double up the mylar uh, kind of protections instead of the single. Um, there's, there's other stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a list of things. And this is like early. This is like in early 2000s they were doing this stuff. So. And it's 2023. It's already, yeah, we're <laughs> 20 years later. Well, I know in the, the engineering community that uh, they're looking at revising some of these uh, equations for stormwater runoff. 
to account for that, but until they do, um, I don't know that has been adopted or in terms of practice. Mm -hmm. It might be something that we just inherently put into our regulations and say, and just increase the, instead of the 100 year storm, maybe it's the 120 year storm, 115 year storm. Uh, and or can we point to, to the uh, most recent revision of the control plan that's on file with the state or something so that instead of us locking into a certain number, it's it's pointing to potentially an evolving number at the state level. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? I, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I can I can talk to our uh, town engineer about, about that. And you right. have to be rewriting hours. Latest approval right. instead of declaring a certain revision. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, because yeah, at some point they're going to have to factor in how much water per time versus, because right now it's like, what is it, eight inches over 48 hours, but we're getting two inches in the half an hour. I mean, right. it's it's causing more of an impact. So I feel like that's going to come into play at some point, and I'd like to have the latest and greatest reference that we're using, mm. not necessarily identifying that in here, a number. So. Okay. But all really good discussion, because I think we're all on the same page, which I, I think is great. Um, and I'm looking forward to changing these regs to update them since it's been a while. Okay. So we'll discuss, I guess, if anyone else wants to discuss anything more along those lines now, or otherwise we can just table it to the next meeting and go through the first four sections of the regs um, and go through a little bit more in detail. Three or four? Um, I think I said section, did I say um, one, two, two, and three. up to three? Yeah. One, two, and three. Yeah. There's 20 sections. There's 20 sections? Total, plus the appendices. Okay, I don't want this to take forever then. So why don't we do... Five by four weeks. Yeah, one through five. Yeah. Some are short, like section six, that's like two paragraphs. One through six it is. I'll also recommend if we have a site walk canceled that we gather anyway and review sections. Uh, Saturday mornings are kind of challenging for me, but... Yeah, and I mean the end, there's very little, I think, changes to make toward the end of the regs. I think the meat of it is right at the start and through a little bit of the middle. So let's let's do one through six. That's that's not overwhelming. Um, and we'll discuss that at the next meeting. All right, so next on the agenda is the uh, reports, chairman's report. I don't have anything um, aside from what we were discussing earlier with the regulations. So then next would be the Inland Wetland Agent Report. Um, I think I've kind of briefed you briefly on the weekend and the rain events and running around at, at those. Um, as you heard, we did receive a application for a five lot Subdivision to come, come up, subdivision. Uh, up on Holmes Road in the corner of Holmes Road and uh, Upper Walnut Hill. Um, I received as of yesterday three uh, administrative applications. I looked at them 94 East Pat for a deck, 25 Upper Pat, deck replacement, 35 Cubels Drive, a deck replacement and expansion. Um, and Further on the agenda is uh, Monaco Ford. I was going to comment on that. I can comment on the order. Um, I, but in regards to that, I did speak to Mr. Monaco today. Um, he is planning to seed the site. Uh, he did note the weather and asked his uh, landscaper to hold off on hydro seeding. Uh, now that the event's over, they'll regrade this week and hopefully be seeded. Are they weekend. regrading towards that? Uh, little detention basin there because when we were there we were there when it rained and right down the middle of the property was a, basically a river going under the silt fence right <laughs> to I mean all the wood chips were absorbing that um, but as a long-term fix that's not gonna continue to work I think they're, they're looking to regrade and see that whole that thing kind of what uh, we were proposing my understanding after talking to him um, based on what Ford would like them to do um, is probably at some time in the future expand the, That's what they said too. the, the mm -hmm. development. Um, so they're looking at some EV charging stations that would be available for even for the public to use. 
So that's something on their immediate radar, and then subsequent to that would be future expansion, um, particularly onto the abutting lot, uh, and that building would come down, and I'm not sure what they would put up. But um, that's what it sounded like his plan was. Um, <coughs> didn't have a timeline. So in the meantime, it was just, we're going to get the site seated, stabilized, and get this thing off my, my desk. Yeah, they have the beginnings of you know a perfect system there already. Mm -hmm that we saw. Um, they just need to, if they do expand over in that, the other section where that little building is, they need to direct that into the existing, what is that? The, the detention basin. The, the, yeah, this huge detention basin that they have, which also has an overflow, like catch basin from that. Okay. It's I, already there. What we did notice was that from the overflow basin, the back side, when they had done their cutting, they had thrown a bunch of limbs and stuff, which looked like that back side was clogged. You know, that yep. came from the basin into the catch basin. Yep. The back pipe, we couldn't find the exit to that, it. That's what I found was covered. Yeah, the roof. Yep. Yes. Okay. I, I certainly, yeah, I think they can divert some of that. If they build that out, they can divert some stormwater to there. But I think the site as a whole, unless they bring it up and fill it, I think is lower in elevation, so they probably have to put in another basin. It's my guess, but... It yeah, would, talking with the woman that was there, she was suggesting that they would probably look to build it up. In which case, but they might be able to use the existing detention basin for right. its size properly. I suspect they would need to increase it to accommodate for additional volume. Mm -hmm. But that might not be a hard thing to do if you're bringing the whole elevation up. Yeah, I mean, the sooner it gets seated, the better, because there is there is a runoff issue. I mean, the wood chips are capturing it for now, but... Correct. Okay. It sounds like they intend to comply. Yeah, they see it. Yeah, they got the first opportunity. That, 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 yeah. that said, um, go quick. in a good faith, too, he, uh, Mr. Monaco, did show up at the last meeting, which was canceled. <laughs> oh. Unfortunately, well. not on our radar, but uh, short of that, I did speak to him today, as I said, and mm -hmm. we'll be seating that hopefully in the next two weeks. Yeah, they seemed very um, interested in, in you know what, whatever they could do to make the site stable and yeah. so. Um, I can personally attest to that uh, none of the turbid be reached the yes, river. You, he yes, you went all the way down. Uh, <laughs> walk, walk the whole watercourse, briars and all. Um, I was yelling for his name. <laughs> he was so far he couldn't even hear me. So. Oh, that was you. Yes, yeah, so um, you hear me? Like, uh, hey, you! <laughs> I, I, uh, I did witness... Get back here! <laughs> I had a job to do. No, and you did a sufficient <laughs> job. There's also a half-barrel 55-gallon uh, drum fire pit and an office chair back there. Oh, there's definitely people living back there. Uh, mm -hmm. on, the mo on the Ford property or no. the further downstream? Uh, on the, on the Ford property, here. behind their uh, detention basin, retention basin, attention basin, um, <laughs> That but before the permanent wetlands. I'll let them know. Well, I think that's. I think they were kind of aware. That's why they moved that little house because they were assuming someone was living in there. Hmm. So I think they're somewhat aware that we did point it out to her. Right. Yeah. We'll see if we can't get the drum removed. I, I mentioned only to. Uh, yeah. This, this, uh, so the seriousness of my inspection would be noted, not because I expected action. Oh, from you to them or anything like that. In the pouring rain, you did a, a very sufficient, yep. yeah. It was actually good to go out there in the rain because we could see where the water yeah, was flowing was. on the way down. We should not really cancel for rain because no. <laughs> that's really the best time to observe these sites. I did I not make that joke. <laughs> Can I ask, so for the five lot subdivision, are we just determining if it goes to public hearing at the next meeting? Correct. Okay, so it's just for determination. It's not. But you, you would hear it's a subdivision applicant. You're going to make a determination if it needs a public hearing. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, you, it has to remain on the agenda for 15 days before you can render a decision. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. All right. Hmm. Anyone have any questions for Gary? So the this goes way back, but uh, over on uh, is it Colton Road? Mm -hmm. There was a storage facility that wanted yep. to make an addition and that's right. luck would have it I go by there once a week taking my grandson to his tennis lessons but it's just a pit it's just dug up and it's it's below the ground level and I don't think it looks anything like what we thought it was going to do 
be. And there's no sheds there. Did they actually, they never actually applied for anything? No, they applied for a building permit. They started <coughs> and they ran into a building permit issue with the building official. I guess and they had to make some changes or to address his concerns. And I think that's what was remaining outstanding. Um, I thought they had addressed it. Um, Mr. Han, I guess, goes to Florida for the winters. So I thought mm -hmm. they addressed it before he left. Um, maybe they haven't because I haven't seen any activity. Yeah, I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's running into the waterway behind it. I, I mean, there is a silt fence up. Did, and to my knowledge, that silt fence, last I checked it, it was working. I can go back out there. I, that was one side I haven't gotten by. Oh, it just, it's, it's a mess and nothing's happening there. So I just, it's, it's all, you know, dug up and dirt. And, and What's the tennis club clearing? The old line? That's going to be a new ropes course slash camp for kids for the summer. Cool. Oh. Where are they clearing? Behind it. Behind the big, so when you so drive there's, on there's the connector. there's wetlands back there. Well, uh, I think. Oh, like the rocking yeah, they cleared a ton yeah. of property. And I'm like, there's no, yeah, that's that's a slime yeah. property. Yeah. So. And that's a clear, <laughs> clear cut. Cool cut. Yes, like acres and acres. So, so if have you seen it? Yeah. No, I would if not. Use the first I'm hearing clearing. If you come off the highway, a ton of clearing. You come off at exit 72 on the highway, and you and you take the connector going down. It'll be on the right, behind the existing tennis club. Yeah. So legally, if there's wetlands there, they can't clear, not clean I, clear I, it. I, clear cut without permit. Clear, right. Think, yeah, they're not, it's not like it's a it, silvicultural op operation, so not that I'm aware of. And usually in those cases, those people, the foresters, they tend to come forward with applications and or just let me know what they're doing. Um, so I suspect that. It's a huge, yeah. I, hmm. It is a huge clearing. I'll go on. Another property yeah. for you to look at. Yeah. I thought for sure you'd be aware. I'm like, I wonder why we didn't see that one. But uh, what I am aware is what I have on the screen here. Uh, if you may remember, we approved a, a single family house or two two single family homes. Uh, there are three lots in here. I don't know why the parcels aren't showing oh, up. Oh, is on this the in the map. Giant's Neck? In Giant's Neck on South Beachwood Road. There's this uh, one house with the yard, the green lawn in the middle. Um, huh. But this corner lot here uh, cleared this area along the corner of Parkview and South Beachwood and graded that's out and filled the, the water course. The that's, habitat. Where, that's where all the water was flowing into. Co correct. And, and oh. here in the highway, uh, or the highway, the road, the road um, washed away. It already was getting washed away. Well, it just wasn't with that, that they were, and then they cleared it wow. and filled it. Yes, yeah, so it's just going to. So that trench, as you can see, goes. In, I don't know if you can make out the red pipe there, but we have an inlet to um, to a pipe. That's where that water goes and enters our, our stormwater system. Um, and so I believe they only left a small, maybe ten foot wide opening um, in front of that inlet. So um, hopefully. I didn't get out there today, but hopefully that, that material at least stayed on the site and then we can have them remove it and restore it. Um, but I do need to send them a letter and let them know that that was conducted a violation. Um, and I think the, the neighbors are concerned. Uh, the guy with the yard here, he, he's the one who contacted us and mm -hmm. complained and was concerned about the water backing up onto his <laughs> property. Because I already have yeah, the stream already runs through the back of mine. I'm just afraid it's going to now flood my entire yeah, backyard. Right, right. Uh, right. Yeah. So, I completely understand that. So we're we're working on that one, um, and that is all I have at this time. So I have a question um, on Giant's Neck Road, where they're putting all the drains, new drains in, um, near where the the um, overhead train goes through. There's one drain that they literally dug a hole on the um, the right side, which is actually marsh. And that water is draining into that hole and then into the marsh. Right. Is that something that they should be doing? I could talk to the town about that. Is it? It's on giant. It's, it's just before the overhead, the train. Okay. Before, before you come train. into my neighborhood. But um, it's it's full. I mean, the the hole that they dug in the marsh yep. is full of water. Sewer. We may have that might be an outlet there, sewer, and they may be have mucked it out. Is what they okay, they and maybe done. that's what they did. Um, we do. There's a parking lot. I have a feeling that's probably what happens. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I can. Well, I don't. Yeah, there's a lot of issues. Well, it's too much pressure. That's right. Too much. Yeah. Fancy neighborhood. I'm assuming that's where you are. Yeah. 
it's that would have been on receiver. that side. Uh, on this system. side here, where there's there's it's a been, yeah, there's a 15 oh, inch huh. or something. pipe. I told yeah. to an outlet he here. Took the bob so that's probably what we cleared out because that was probably on the ground. There's steps right there. Um, I can talk to Bill, take a look, and just see if we need any like rip wrap or something just to make sure it's. And then my other comment, and I don't know if anybody's seen yeah, Exit 74, but you know we spent a lot of time um, years ago with all those apartments that went up there, and I noticed like the emergency um, road is all torn up now, and that was all wetlands. Next, that runs along 95. Do you remember? And then yeah. there's a couple of big basins there. Yep. Yeah. Now they, they took down the trees, and I know uh, so many trees. I know it's yeah. so weird. Trees. Yes, yeah. Mr. Mulholland was. Uh, I'm getting lost when I go down there. Aggravated in that he he didn't have control over that because those trees were not on the Costco property, but in the state highway, and that the state is taking them down for their the project. So mm -hmm. that being said, um, I don't know. We'll have to work with the state and trying to get some sort of screen back if it's possible at the end of all of this. Um, I don't know, but I didn't notice that the emergency access was dug up. Well, in that believe, area, like behind yeah. the pool, the pool uh, business. Yep. Uh, There's an area in there where the highway ramps are gonna are lo going to be right. located. Yeah. Uh, that's where the off ramp will be coming through there. And then there's there's a vernal pool literally down the emergency access drive along the adjacent right. 295, yep. which, if I recall, I think Mr. Rabbit who said it was one of the most highly functioning. Rural pools that he's seen and was surprised based on his proximity to 95. Mm -hmm. so. Is that where they took where all the trees are down and the brush is piled up right next to that now? You can see uh, it from the highway. Oh, yeah, you're talking about Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 You know, even on the other side of the road behind what's now, I think, the gun club, there's all those Phragmites and they actually plowed through the Phragmites. Now, with Phragmites, they're usually, they're, they don't, they're not in dry areas. There's always yeah. um, yeah. a damp yeah, rural pool swamp whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. So I mean, here we are setting up all our nice rules and the state comes in and does their <laughs> thing. Bulldozes everything. <laughs> no, imagine if it was the federal government. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're actually making some changes to the definitions of wetlands, <laughs> the federal government. So that'll, I'll let you know when that. To the good or? Uh, um, I, I don't know. I, I <laughs> couldn't say it was a good or bad, but. Well, they uh, didn't do the time zone thing, right? So. I'm not sure what they're going to look like when they're finished, um, but I think that it's. Uh, I think they're trying to make it a little more, more like Connecticut in terms of. A little, I don't. Say, I guess I don't say that's for the good, but it's more restrictive. I guess. Hmm. I don't want to say that restrictive. Um, broaden definition. And even across from the transfer station. I know we've talked about that property before. You know, um, a while ago they were breaking up stones, and recently they had a lot of uh, topsoil there, and I think some of the topsoil. You know, is that supposed to be an area where you can process? Yeah, I drove by there yesterday, and they had the huge machinery, and they're processing. Correct. So I, well, I saw there's a gentleman in a uh, backhoe uh, hammering the ledge. So I was looking at that and said, okay, you're hammering out the ledge. That's probably for the sight line, which made sense to me. So that, that coincides with the subdivision activity. But the stockpiles of material and the mm -hmm. processing machine, I said, you know, <laughs> I wasn't aware that we issued a, a, a mining permit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, it's something I will contact Mr. Wieson and ask Mr. Mulholland to follow up in terms of the use oh my God, that's going on out there. But with the, the pile of soil, there's a vernal pool that kind of slopes down, and it's been there for yeah. years. I mean, I notice it all the time, and I just have a feeling that eventually it's going to get filled in. Yeah. Plus, you know, with all the winds that we've had, you know, a lot of the soil is just flying around. And that's one thing I've, I've noticed in town, uh, particularly with 95 and is dust control mm. uh, and some of the difficulty there is that we're not allowing developers to use uh, sodium chloride because it's within our water supply watershed so you just need to apply water that becomes a little problematic and it's harder to control dust when you have to 
repeatedly add water and have someone running a truck all the time. And, um, so it's just a challenge from that perspective. Uh, there's not, I don't think there's much we can do about that. So how does the sodium keep the um, dust down? I'm not sure how the chemical process works, but it, it, I think it causes the, the, the soils to bind and kind of weighs, you know, together. If they get wet or something? Wet charge. charge. Do they use potassium and chloride? Chloride? Yeah, yeah. maybe it's potassium, potassium sodium. Mm. Sodium chloride, chloride would just dissolve and dissolve. Yeah, water. Do nothing. I think it's potassium. No, it's potassium dissolves as well. Anyway, whatever the chemical is, mm -hmm. how about that? For lack of a better term, I can't, I can't think of it. But they should also recognize that they're working within a, a protected area and they need to, to further protect the soils that are there. I mean, well, the air. it's more challenging for them for a reason. Calcium chloride. Calcium chloride, thank you. Why don't we regulate that? What do we, calcium? Watershed. So our, the Water and Sewer Commission mm -hmm. and the Public Utilities Engineer prefers that we don't use the chemical within our drinking water supply watersheds. Our prefers are right there. Mm -hmm. so we recommend application of just water. We need about six Gary's, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, well, that, that said, uh, I will let you know that uh, we've been able to keep Allie Christensen on at about roughly 10 hours a week. Okay. Um, so she just uh, finished defending her thesis as of May 3rd, that's tomorrow. So hopefully some time after that, we'll be able to get maybe a couple more hours from her. Um, and then we'll see what happens with the budget. That's where you put in for 30, but they might cut you down to 15. Uh, the, the budget moving forward has 15,000 in, uh, the, in the wetlands line item, and there's another 15,000 in the planning budget. So combined, there's 30,000. Good start. Yeah, because I, I think a, a big part of the issue is that there's just there's not enough monitoring because you can't be everywhere at once, and there's a lot of development happening in town, and Correct. you can't be everywhere. So, I mean, this was an easy agenda for today, and look all the stuff we dumped on you. Go look at this. Go look at that. <laughs> it's all right. No so it, you know, yeah, there'll, there'll always be work. Uh, that that's for sure, regardless of whether I'm here or anyone else. So. Just chip away and do the best we can. That's our mm -hmm. contribution. All right. Well, on that note, do I hear a motion to adjourn? <sighs> Make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. I'll second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everybody.